الله الله لا إله إلا الله 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 إذا فرغت فانصب وإلى ربك فغب سرك الله معزي And this means have we not expanded your chest and we removed from you your burden which had weighed upon your back right? and granted you an exalted reputation so verily with every difficulty there is relief verily with every difficulty there is relief and then when you are free from your obligations strive hard to worship God and be devoted to your Lord's service so inshallah today if time permits we're going to be talking about just the first three verses Right? And there are lots to be talked about, so inshallah. So, um, the background of this uh, surah is that it was revealed in Makkah. And um, according to Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says that this surah al-Inshira was revealed almost immediately after surah al-Duha. Because the theme is the same, the period of revelation, the nature of uh, the surah is the same. And uh, the general big subject and theme is that this surah gives hope and encouragement in a time of darkness and difficulty for the Prophet. Right, remember, he was at a time when he received revelation and people knew about Islam by then. And then a few months, and some narration says it was six months, there was silence. And then uh, people were saying, Ya Muhammad, your God has abandoned you. So you need to abandon your God now and join us back to the uh, religion of your forefathers. And so he was anxious. Did I do something wrong? Right, so these words from Allah gave him some form of comfort. Right, and so this verse, this chapter is about that. It's about hope and encouragement. When Surah al duha we focus on how positive thinking for a Muslim in order for you to increase the level of taqwa is important. In Surah al Insha, we talk about despite positive thinking, we must believe in hope, we must believe in encouragement, and this comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a Muslim cannot be and should not be de de depressed. If you are depressed, then our level of hope is not enough. Our level of faith is not enough that we hinge upon Allah. Because we are not sure, is Allah coming to help me? Right? Is it enough, His help for me? But if someone who truly believes, he is neither too happy, because whatever good Allah gives to him, right, he can always take it back. And he will be accountable for these things that Allah gave to him. And whatever test that Allah gives to him, it is for a greater wisdom. And when Allah gives, Allah takes. So he will come back to a state where he's happy. So he's always in the middle path. And there's simply one of the major principles in Islam, being moderate in the middle path. Right? Okay. So let's talk about uh, Surah Al-Ishra. Um, like we said, this verse, this chapter is to console the Prophet and to encourage him. Um, particularly after he was appointed as a Prophet, it's a completely new experience for him. Um, most of us, um, to a certain extent, whether we like it or not, are leaders. Whether we are a leader in a family, leader at work, leader amongst our friends. But imagine whatever kind of leadership we have. This is one million or you know, one billion times more. Because the Prophet ﷺ has been appointed as the leader of not only the Muslims, but also the leader of mankind. So it's a daunting new experience for him. He's not experienced this before. He, as you know, is a simple man. He didn't go to school. He, he travels for trade and, you know, he just do simple, normal things that, you know, you and I probably do. And then, when Revelation appointed him as a prophet, he became the spiritual leader, the political leader, the economic leader of all the Muslims and eventually for all the world. So this was something which caused him also added anxiety. After having been uh, silenced with regards to Revelation and then Allah pacify him, and then Allah says, Alam nashrah laka sadrak. Right? And this is sort of a consolation. After performing your job, I know it's going to be tough. I know it's going to be daunting. I know it's going to be challenging. But what is life without a challenge? Right? This new experience will raise you. And later we talk about, have we not raised you to an exalted station? Right? So he was faced with difficulties as well in this new world because the very people who look up to him and you know the Arabs like to give uh, each other sort of like a, a, a pen name, nama timangan right so um, and you cannot just have one guy naming you this name it must be a name that the community or, uh, of that area agrees with you that you are deserving of that title so as we know before the Prophet ﷺ became a prophet he was already given the title of Al-Amin the trustworthy one, right? 
I mean, even after being a prophet, even despite not believing in his message, many of the Quraysh were, were putting him as their safety deposit, leaving with him all their material possessions because he, they knew. Although they don't believe in Islam, they don't believe in Allah, they know that he is a good man, he will not cheat them of their wealth. So, he was named, given the title of Alamin to the extent that one day when the rebuilding of the Kaaba, and so when you want to put this Hajar Aswad at the corner, and every tribe wanted to have the honor to be remembered down in the annals of history that we were the tribe that put this uh, black stone. Uh, on, on the Kaaba, and so there was this agreement, and you know it turned quite rather nasty. And then someone said, "Okay, fine. Let's not. Let's do this. Let's just wait, and let God send someone to instruct us. Which is next morning, Subo, whoever walks through that gate, through that door, he will be the one who determines for us. And so when Rasulullah came to that door and he said, "Ah, mashallah, he's the correct man." It is what we wanted actually, but none of us wanted to say it because if we said him, then we said, ah, then Banu Hashim. Right? So we don't want to elevate or give special treatment to any special tribe. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi came and he, he heard the situation and he said, okay, that's easy. He said, give me a piece of cloth and then he put uh, the black stone in, in, on the cloth and he said, okay, all the tribes will have the honor of carrying this black stone and they will carry it along the side of the, of the cloth. And then once he reached the Kaaba, Rasulullah then took his hand, took the, took the stone and then put it there. So the honor eventually really goes back to the Prophet. But everybody was happy because they took a part in, in doing that honorable thing. Right? So, but these people, the very people that says and declare that Rasulullah was an Al-Amin, the truthful one. The moment he came with the message, the very same people who attribute him this characteristic, this title said, no, you're not anymore. Like you see the hypocrisy of mankind, right? The very same people with the same conditions, the man didn't change, but just because you don't like the message that he brings, because what it affects your economic prosperity, you know, because they, they earn uh, through managing the entrance to the Kaaba, uh, so that people can visit the, the idols around the Kaaba. And so when Islam came and there was no uh, idol, and it was threatening their economic position, right? So just because you didn't like the message, you said he's no longer considered as an alami. So these were the difficulties that he find. And this uh, ob objections does not come only from the people or the community, but it also comes from his family members, from his tribe, from close relatives. And you know, Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, they're all related to the Prophet Sallallahu And they were the strongest <laughs> opponents to the Prophet Sallallahu However, there is always, and it is a, it is a surah of hope and encouragement. And so then Allah reveals himself. And another thing about this surah, is that even as a prophet, even as a man chosen by God to perform his work, he does not escape from difficulties. Always when you're doing something new, the initial stage is always the toughest. You gotta set things up. You're not, you're not uh, adjusted to the condition. You're not adjusted to being the glare of the community, right? So the initial stage has, is always difficult. However, Allah says, eventually the hereafter will be good for you. Right? And this also stress in Surah Al-Duha that we talked about two weeks ago. So, um, and then Allah says uh, in Surah Al-Duha, He says, khayru, ula, And verily, the hereafter is better for you than the present. And, we, and three weeks ago, we talked about this meaning two things. One, the increase, the physical increase in the believers. So the message has been received and so more Muslims, uh, more people are embracing Islam. And two, the hereafter in terms of the big picture, the hereafter. So the temporary world and the hereafter. And so this explains why the Prophet was very uh, detached from things in the world. We're not saying that we should let go of everything. Maybe we are not prophets and we need a job. Uh, we need maybe a car to transport us. You know, some of us need that, some, some, some of us don't. I'm not saying that we let go of all this. But the question really for Muslims is, at this, at this, in this context of this world that we live in, what do we do with what we have? Because we are going to be questioned with what do we do with what we have? Islam does not teach you to be poor. In fact, you look at, you know, uh, messages and stories of uh, sahabas 
Ibn Abdurrahman ibn Aung, for example, he came one day into the city of Medina and people thought there was an earthquake and a sandstorm because the ground was shaking and then all the dust pasir pasir dekat padang pasir and then you know what happened actually Abdul Rahman ibn Aouf was coming in and he brought with him 700 camels 700 camels and some other possessions imagine having 700 camels that's not the only camels he had by the way it's recorded that he's been, he gave 1500 camels to the soldiers of Islam so in this particular incident he came by 700 and people thought it was um, it was an uh, earthquake and so Sayyidina Aisha radiallahu anha came out and said oh there was uh, Ibn uh, Abdul Rahman bin Auf. And so she said, and I remembered the Prophet Sallallahu said, Abdul Rahman bin Ibn Auf, and he's one of the ten promised paradise, will enter into paradise leaping, leaping, as in jumping, behind the Prophet. And so when Sayyidina Aisha uh, narrated this hadith, everybody, oh yeah, yeah, we heard this, we heard this. It's not a, 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 an ahad hadith, it's a mutawakil. A lot of people know about this hadith. And then so when eventually this word came to Abdul Rahman, he remembered it. Oh, mashallah. But then he said, I don't want to jump behind the Prophet to enter paradise. I want to walk up straight, proud and strong behind the Prophet to walk into paradise because it is a place where Allah is and I want to be proud going there. And so he says, by Allah, all my 700 camels and all the treasures that they carry on today, I distributed and gave it to all the people of Medina. And these are some of the characteristics of the Sahabas who were promised paradise. And you remember when he entered into Medina, when the first Hijra, right? He was offered half of my wealth. You can take the sec uh, my second, or you can take any of my wife. By his, uh, there's a buddy buddy system. But what was the response of Abdul Rahman bin Auf? He said. No, thank you very much. I appreciate your kind gesture. But show me the market, surely I can make my wealth there. And look at what he did. And so the whole idea is a good, wealthy, uh, educated, influential Muslim only needs, leads to one thing. He is not therefore dependent on someone else because he is independent of everybody else because he is sustaining in his work. And so his only dependence would be within him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is part of what we need to do as Muslims. Be successful. Be, be wealthy. It's nothing wrong. But the whole question reverts for us would be what do we do with what we have? So for example, we have more than extra wealth. Then perform the zakat. Perform the charity. For example, you see there's some innovations going on in Afala Mosque drop by the box. We're not asking for $1,000. Even if you have $1, because it's not the quantum that is important, it is the act itself. And when, once you did the act, it is in the consistency of the act that pleases Allah much. Because your deeds, in hadith by the al Bukhari, you be, do good deeds regularly, moderately, honestly. Because your deeds will not promise you paradise. But what is most beloved by Allah is the small, regular, but constant deeds that you perform. So don't worry if you're going to put into the tabung is thin. So you want to put one dollar, cling, cling, cling. It's okay. Because why? You're not going to be answerable to anybody who's laughing or smiling at you. But your deed in helping uh, in the development of the mosque. Every day, hundreds of people come to the mosque. And what will you get? The reward. Even though you are already in the grave. And this is Amal Jariah. Right? So the question is really not to be wealth, not to be poor, not to be useless, but you saw as high as you can as a Muslim because that's our jihad, to be the best that we can, because that's Ihsan. Right? However, we must be responsible as Khalifa, what do we do with it? Right? So, then we finally come to the surah, and like I said, we only will talk about one verse today because of time. And there's a lot to talk about. Allah says, Alam nashrah laka sadarak. Have we not expanded your breast? Have we not expanded and opened up your chest? And these are the translations that you find in various tafsir. Now, so in order to understand this, we need to talk about some of these words that Allah used in, in the Quran. Alam nashrah, shar. Right? This word means to open up, to reveal, to make known what used to be very difficult to understand. 
Right? Last time I don't understand this, but when Allah says alam nashrah, He opens up, He makes it, He reveals what it what it means that you previously were not able to decipher. Right? So maybe because it was complex, maybe because it is out of this world, so we cannot even imagine what it means. And so the result of when Allah says alam nashrah like a sabra, if you not open or expanded your chest for you simply means that he is making Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam remember there is a chapter on hope and encouragement peace be pleased and to be contented with his lot with his condition with all these challenges that he's facing through in life with all these uh, people who used to love him now hates him and this uh, the more poisonous will be it comes from your own family members themselves right so the barrier of understanding the veil the hijab is lifted he now begins to understand that he has to go through this test and he has to bear this with patience. And so, in reality, when Allah says, Alam nashrah laka sadra, not only does he leave the veil, he is comfort, comfort, comforting the heart of the Prophet Sallallahu He is giving, he is putting the mind of the Prophet at ease so that he can concentrate on the job, on the message. Rather than being concerned about why are you doing this to me, I'm feeling so sad that my family members have, uh, you know, opposed me. That sort of thing. So there's alam nashrah, the opening up. Like a sadrak, sadr, right? Sadr is the opening of your chest, the chest, right? And so we can look at it because sadr also relates to a literal thing, like your chest, your heart. So we can look at it from a literal point of view. And Allah has indeed opened up the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Some say once, some say twice, whether you believe it or not. At the first time, when he was young, when he was playing, when Angel Gabriel came and then opened up the chest, washed with Zamzam water, and then when he was playing, you know, when he was a young boy. And then the second incident was before he performed the Isra and Miraj. And it only makes sense because he was going to say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beyond the lottery, beyond what Jibreel and Islam can even go through. So in order for you to reach there, it must come from a state of the heart which is pure. If Nabi Musa a.s. had to climb and meet Allah and then when he finally climb up the mountain and Allah says, you are not fit enough to meet me, to speak to me at this point, you have to fast for 40 days. Purification as well. Same like this, but this is instant. Angels came and then washed and then put back and then there you go. You are purified. Alright? Um, and this marriage of this word uh, shar and sadr right? alam nashra like a sadr right uh, are used in at least four places in the Quran and today I'm just going to share with you because they probably talk about the same thing and in surah uh, al-an'am Allah says so whoever Allah wishes to guide and the word come again alright he expands his breath for him he expands his breath for him to contain Islam yash uh, yashra sadrahu the Islam he expands the breast so that he can embrace, he can contain Islam. And then, of course, uh, in Surah Taha, Allah says, Rabbi Shahri Sadri. Again, Shar and Sadr. Right? Oh, my Lord, exp expand for me my breast. So, these are two ex different examples that I'm going to be uh, ex talking about. So, if you look at the word, Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrax, right? Uh, Shahr and Sadr, I use not once but four times in the Quran together. And what can we learn from here? So to explain and to interpret Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrak, have you not expanded your chest for you? There's two ways to look at it based on this, the help of these other verses. One, Allah is expanding the chest of the Prophet to comfort him in performing da'wah, in enabling him to invite others to Islam. Right? So like we said just now, comforting him so that he will not feel anxious, so that he can concentrate on doing his job well, so he can deliver the message clearly, succinctly and convincingly. Because that's an important role for him, knowing that he was the last prophet. But the second interpretation can also be that the expansion of his chest in preparation for him to carry the weight of the Quran, the weight of Islam within him. Why do I say this? Because remember, in Surah Al-Hashr, Allah says, "Lau anzalna hadha al-Qur'an ala jabalin la ra'aytahu khash'an mutasaddi'an min khashyatillah. So Allah says, if we had sent down the Qur'an upon a jabal, upon a mountain, you would have seen the mountain humbled and coming apart from fear of Allah. And we see in the way that Allah revealed Himself, 
even to the Quran in the time of Nabi Musa alayhi salam, the mountain crumbled. And now Allah says, had we revealed the Quran on the mountain, he would humble in himself and come apart. So if that is the case, imagine how would it be when Allah through Jibreel wanted to send the revelation of the Quran of his own words to the Prophet. It goes to his heart, isn't it? Right? Then like Jibreel sent the revelation to the heart of the Prophet. And that's why you see some of his reactions sometimes, um, you know, to, in, to, to show that he's receiving revelation. So he sent from heart to heart. And if the heart of the Prophet is a normal, normal human heart like yours and mine, if the mountain can crumble, surely you, will, you and I will also become obsolete. We will all die. But Allah is expanding. Alam nashrah laka sadrak. I am expanding your chest so that you are able to receive revelation when it comes. And so you can contain it. Right? So this is one of the ways in which we understand this verse. And then we look at some of the favors in which Allah has talked about to the Prophet. So in Surah al duha we says, um, Allah says, Have you not found you an orphan and give you refuge? Have you not found you wandering and then guide you? Have you not found you poor but then we make you rich? Right? In Surah al duha So if we talk about in the Arabic language, when we want to say, Have I not expanded your breast? We will say, Alam nashrah sadraka laka. Alam nashra, have we not expanded your chest laka for you, O Muhammad? That's the normal way in which you communicate. Have I not done this for you? For you, laka at the back. But this verse is unique. This verse, alam nashra, laka is in the middle, sadrak. So in the, the translation, literally would be, did we not expand for you, O Muhammad, your chest, your heart? So that the, the lesson. If you, if, you, if you take this from the linguistic point of view, one of the favors that Allah gives is also in the way that He put the word laka. He did not put it at the back, but He put it in the center, alam nashrah laka sadrak, not alam nashrah sadraka laka. Right? So this means He purposely opened only the heart of the Prophet for Him and not for anyone else. You understand this? Right? So this verse is not talking about I'm going, to, I'm going to open your heart and in this case since I'm talking to you Ya Muhammad Laka This is Alam Nashah Laka I'm opening your heart for you O Muhammad Your chest So this opening of the heart this expansion of understanding this lifting of the veil this ability to conceptualize understand and appreciate and embrace his role is only for the Prophet. No one gets it before him, no one gets it after him. And this is one of the added favors on top of the favors we've learned in Surah Al Duha last week with regards to these three things. Alright, so like I said, that's why we're talking about only one verse today. There's a lot to be talked about. Alright, and this also, so as a last point before we end today's Kulia, uh, in Surah Al Insha, Allah says, Alam Nashah Lak Sadrak. So we have opened up for you your heart. But we compare this because this is the same concept, the same words, the same favor, the same even we talk about Sharh and Sadr, right? We use in another verse and this happens in the story of Nabi Musa alayhi salam. So Nabi Musa alayhi salam went um, uh, after he was found uh, killing an Egyptian, he went to the desert for 10 years and then after that period of 10 years many things of course happened in preparation for his role. Then Allah came to him, Allah uh, revealed to Nabi Musa alayhi salam, Musa, now you've got, you've got to go back to Pharaoh, to Pharaoh, and release the slaves. And of course, Musa, as we all know, has a few issues. One, he says, well, I am a, bound, I'm, you know, I'm a wanted man. They want me because I murdered an Egyptian, and so I'll be arrested. And secondly, he has a speech impediment, he has a problem with speech. Because when he was young, he choose a burning coal and put it in his tongue. So you always speak with the lips. You know, always with the S at the back. Right? So, and then he tells him, like, Ya Allah, I'm a wanted man and I have a speech impediment. Why would and how would Pharaoh listen to me? So Allah gave him two things. Allah says, take Harun with you. And then Allah inspired him this du'a. So when Rasulullah was given alam nashrah, he was given 
Rabbi Shrahli Sadri Alam Nashrah Laka Sadrak Rabbi Shrahli Sadri Have we not expanded for you your chest, O Muhammad? So the Prophet didn't have to ask. He was given. He was, in fact, we talk about, we talk about literally, Allah has really expanded twice. When he was a young boy, before he went from uh, Isra Mi'raj. Alright? And, but in the story of Nabi Musa alayhi salam, he had to ask, Rabbi Shrahli, O Allah, Rabbi Shrahli, please expand for me my chest. You understand this? As a comparison. And this is the unique position in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which the Prophet sallam, stands before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He does it before he was asked. In fact, uh, in Surah Al-Fat, Allah says, إِنَّ فَتَحْنَا لَكَ فَتَحْنَا مُبِينَا لِيَا غَفِرَ لَكَ اللَّهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخَرَ For verily we have forgiven you your past and your future sins. He didn't ask. But he keep on asking for forgiveness every day, even more than us. Right? The Prophet ﷺ was recorded to have asked for to have uh, asked for repentance between 70 to 100, day, 100 times a day. How much repentance do we ask? And who needs the repentance? Rasulullah? No. Allah has already forgiven him for the past and for his possible future actions, if at all. But we were never promised that forgiveness from Allah. And we ask less than the Prophet. Right? So this is the beauty of the uniqueness of the position that the Prophet occupied with Allah. And vicariously, mashallah, we benefit from this because we are his ummah. And we, are, we see this, we discuss this when we talk about Surah Doha two weeks ago. For example, we get the kawthar. For example, we get the dua of intercession. For example, we get salvation by, you know, by wudu. And, and many, many other things. To the extent that in the end, uh, Allah says, Ya Muhammad, take out everyone from hellfire who in his heart have faith the size of a mustard seed. You know what is a mustard seed? Right? <laughs> Small. If you have faith in your heart the size of that mustard seed, if you believe in the Prophet, in the Hadith, then that's the salvation. That's the intercession. And so this is because not of what you do. And this is because of not what and who you are. It cannot be. It is because of the position, of the honor of Rasulullah before Allah's eyes and we benefited by carelessly, even though most of the times we don't deserve it. Even though most of the times we don't deserve it. Right? So, um, to end, um, because next week then, then we talk about verse 2 and verse 3 inshallah together. Um, this verse was revealed as a verse to give the Prophet hope and encouragement and he was given at a time when he was down he was anxious to perform his new role and he wasn't sure how to go about it and he was feeling in his, he was feeling insecure because those who loved him his family members now abandoned him and they were torturous to him and they were giving insults about him and they were accusing Allah through him look your God has abandoned you abandoned him there were all this lure and distractions that was up for him and these are the things that we, we experience as human beings on a day-to-day -day level. Sometimes whether it be at work, whether it be with our colleagues, or even at home with our friends, or sometimes or maybe for male, female colleagues, for female, male colleagues, or whatever it is that we go through. There will be these distractions. Or sometimes our heart is so low because of things that happen to us or things that doesn't happen to us, that we ask, Ya Allah, where are you? Never, never ask where are you. Never ask Allah why. Because it's always with you. Why you don't feel it? Because our heart is not connected with Him. We are not, you know, when we have a phone, we always charge the handphone. In the first thing we wake up in the morning, we charge, right? So we are connecting. This time we wake up, we just go, we just do our thing. Right? We are not remembering Allah for most of the parts. We're not asking you to take the task, we're going around or chat Allah. No, we're not. That remembrance, that consciousness, that dhikr is also in your heart. And you must always be connected, be attached. If you are conscious, and that's why we talk about, right, uh, maybe last month when I, when I begin this series of talks and I talk about taqwa. Taqwa is not whatever we think of. Taqwa, in reality, the purpose of it is to bring us to a state of consciousness. Because when, you know, the khatib says every Friday, avoid what Allah prohibits and all that. What is all that? That is, that is so that at all times you remember God. Is it something that Allah allows? Is it something that Allah forbids? Should, when you want to eat at this restaurant, is it something that Allah permits? Is it something that is grey? So I try to avoid. 
So it's consciousness. So when you are conscious, then you will feel, then you begin to realize that He's with you. And so that's what Allah says, and He does not abandon you, neither is He displeased with you. It's that we are displeased with God, it's that we have forgotten Him. So, if you are conscious, if you remember, then all these things that happened to the Prophet, to some extent, in his encouragement, in the way Allah pacifies, in the way Allah advises, in the way Allah consoles, will happen to us. Open the Quran and we read. And that's where it becomes, the Quran says, it is the cure for the heart. No need to pay one thousands of dollars and see a doctor for small ailments. You know, of course, you need to put an effort to see a doctor if you know it's a, if it's a bad, uh, serious ailment. Open the Quran, pray, and ask. Connection, open. Always charge your battery. So that when you need it, there's battery. Otherwise, when you want to call emergency code, Alma, 0%. How to call? Right? Okay, so inshallah, I hope we have benefited to a certain extent with. Uh, you see, it's just only one verse, inshallah. So tomorrow, next week, we'll talk about some other verses uh, to complete this surah. Uh, we hope you benefit from it. And importantly, when you go home, when you go back to work, or wherever it is that you go back to, try to remember this points and put it into practice. Maybe, for example, the easiest would be try to remember Allah as much as you can. Try to have this connection. Try to have this open communication. So whenever you feel that you need Him, even without uttering it, you feel His presence. And that will give you a source of comfort, inshallah. So I'll see you again next week, inshallah, to continue with this uh, Surah al Inshara. And then let's close this uh, Kulia by Satin Tasbih Kafara and Surah al Asr. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nasta'ufuka wa atubu ilayhi. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa al-Asr illa al-Insan wa al-Khusr. Illa al-Ladina amanu wa amanu salihati wa tawasubil haq. Tawasubil salihati wa 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 sal